Hey guys, welcome back. So in this video, we'll be continuing our discussion on the thermodynamics of reacting systems. And this time we'll be exploring systems involving oxidation reduction reactions, in particular, those reactions which occur in electrochemical cells. So electrochemical cells have many practical applications. So the most commonly encountered one is probably the battery. But in the context of analytical chemistry, on the other hand, electrochemistry also has a lot of applications because electrochemical cells offer a way to correlate measurable quantities like potential and current to thermodynamic properties like activity, gives free energy, and the equilibrium constant. So there are a lot of analytical techniques based on electrochemistry, such as voltammetry, and of course we also have potentiometry, which you've probably done before if ever you've used a pH meter. So overall, electrochemistry is a very rich topic of discussion, but for our video, we'll be limiting ourselves to a general overview. So we'll start off with the basics of electrochemical cells and some ways that we could relate our thermodynamic parameters with cell potential. Then we'll enumerate different types of electrodes and the different factors affecting single electrode potentials and then finally we'll put everything together and we'll look at different ways that we could construct an electrochemical cell and use it for different types of problems okay so let's just get some basics of electrochemical cells so an electrochemical galvanic cell is one which produces an electric current as a result of a spontaneous chemical reaction okay in particular these types of reactions are redox reactions so if the reaction is non-spontaneous on the other hand we typically call it an electrolytic cell instead but anyway an example of a redox reaction that we might see in a cell is one between zinc and copper okay so according to this reaction we could have a piece of zinc metal and dip it in a solution with cupric ions and eventually we'll see the deposition of copper metal on the surface of our zinc okay so this process is definitely spontaneous Okay, but the setup, however, is not an electrochemical cell. Okay, so the reason for this is that there's no electric current produced since the reactants are all in contact and the system is essentially short circuited. Okay, so in other words, there's no direction in which the electrons are forced to flow. So we can't exactly extract any useful work from the movement of electrons in this case. So the solution to this is to separate the reaction into parts. Okay. So on one side, we could have our zinc metal immersed in zinc sulfate. And on the other side, we have copper metal immersed in a solution of copper to sulfate. Okay, so the two solids in this case are your electrodes. So electrodes are where redox reactions take place. So the electrode where oxidation takes place is the anode. Okay, so whereas the electrode where reduction takes place is called the cathode okay so the usual mnemonic to remember this is an ox meaning anode oxidation and red cat meaning well cathode and reduction okay well anyway we also have conventional polarities for the electrodes so the anode is assigned a negative charge whereas the cathode is assigned a positive charge okay so also by convention we have electrons flowing from the negatively charged anode to the positively charged cathode okay however if we just connect our electrodes with separate solutions as is the tendency is the reaction will fizzle out due to unbalanced charges because on the anode side we have the formation of excess positive charge over here okay so we could see this from the half reaction that occurs in the anode okay so we form zinc 2 plus whereas on the cathode side we have the removal of positive charge therefore we have an excess of negative charge remaining okay namely the sulfate ions okay so the solution to this is to add a so-called salt bridge okay so this figure completes our electrochemical cell diagram and this particular cell involving zinc and copper is called the daniel cell okay but overall the salt bridge allows the completion of the circuit in a way so from the salt bridge, we have anions moving towards the anode to account for the excess positive charge formation. And we have cations moving towards the cathode to account for the excess 
negative charge formation. Okay, so the typical setup for a salt bridge is to have a saturated salt solution, usually KCl or potassium nitrate in agar. So the choice of salt is usually that which is inert with respect to the redox reaction, and also which has relatively equal ion velocities for the cation and the anion. Okay, so this makes sure that as we're transferring anions towards the anode. Okay, we have an equal rate of movement of cations towards the cathode. Okay, so this just makes sure that we don't have any excess buildup of any one charge on any side. So we typically have our salt in agar, and the purpose of agar is to prevent the electrode solutions from mixing while permitting the passage of current carried by the ions. Okay, so later on we'll talk about the implications of a salt bridge on the properties of our electrochemical cells. Okay, so we could also symbolically represent the electrochemical cell using a cell diagram. So in this notation, we just indicate the species involved in the electrochemical cell and separate the species using single bars, which represents phase bound. Boundaries. Okay, so over here we have zinc solid. Okay, and then it's separated with a bar from our other phase over here, which is a zinc sulfate solution. Okay, so we also use double bars, which indicates a salt bridge. Okay, so on the left side we denote the oxidation reaction or the anode, and on the right side we denote the reduction reaction or the cathode. Okay, so note that the order in which the species are written on the electrodes are also consistent with the reaction that occurs there. Okay, so for example, in the anode, the oxidation reaction is zinc solid forming zinc two plus. So the anode is written in a way that zinc. Is written first, followed by the solution containing zinc two plus. Okay, so same thing goes for the cathode. So we have copper two plus forming copper solid. So the cell is written by denoting the salt containing copper two first, followed by copper solid. Okay, so this serves as a useful guide to figure out the reactions involved in a cell diagram. Okay, so once we know the half reactions, we can balance and add those reactions together to get our net reaction. Okay, so note as well that in this diagram we have electron flow from right to left for a galvanic cell. But of course, if we have an electrolytic cell, the reverse would occur. Okay, so another important property of electrochemical cells is the potential difference between the electrodes. Okay, so this is also known as your electromotive force (EMF) or the cell potential. Okay, so it's this electromotive force that drives current flow in the electrochemical cell. Okay, so if there is a positive cell potential, this implies that we have a spontaneous electron flow. Okay, so this corresponds to a galvanic cell. Okay, so we could look at the chemical reaction and the potential that drives this current flow more closely by noting that we could divide the redox reaction into two parts, right? Okay, so we have of course the anode half reaction or the oxidation reaction and the cathode half reaction or the reduction reaction. Okay, so as you know, the sum of the half reactions gives us the net reaction, which will have a corresponding cell potential, right? Okay, so likewise, we could also say that the total cell EMF may also be thought of being composed of two individual single electrode potentials. Okay, so the sum of which is going to be equal to the total EMF of the cell. Okay, we have in the anode the anode potential or the oxidation potential, and in the cathode we have the cathode potential or the reduction potential. Okay, so again, adding these two together, like adding the half reactions, will give us the total cell potential. Okay, but the problem is, however, is that it's only potential differences in cells that can be measured experimentally because it's not possible to measure the potential of a half reaction alone because reduction and oxidation cannot occur independently of one another. Okay, so in other words, whenever we have reduction, we also have a corresponding oxidation. Okay, the one way that we can measure single electrode potentials, however, is to Couple the electrode with another known potential, okay? Particularly one that has been set as a zero potential, okay? So this electrode that has zero potential is just an arbitrarily assigned reference electrode. So it could honestly be anything, okay? Just so long as we all agree on it, okay? So overall, we could figure out the unknown 
single electrode potential here by measuring the cell potential and always keeping in mind that the summation of the single electrode potentials is equal to the overall cell potential. Since we assigned the potential of the reference electrode, okay, so we could immediately correlate the measured cell potential with that of the single electrode potential of our unknown electrode, okay? So the electrode that we agreed on as our primary reference is Xi, or the standard hydrogen electrode, okay? So the setup of Xi is very specific. It involves the reduction of hydrogen ions at standard activity of 1 to form hydrogen gas at a standard pressure of 1 atm or vice versa, okay? But the problem with Xi, however, is that it's actually pretty difficult to prepare and also use. So the alternative is to use secondary reference electrodes whose potentials have been previously measured against a primary reference electrode and has the additional advantage of being a little bit more robust for use. So the common secondary reference electrode is the calomel electrode, which is mercury-based, however. Okay, so the reduction half-reaction for this is mercurous chloride, also known as your calomel, forming liquid mercury and chloride ion. Okay, so the electrode representation for this would be in the anode form, we have mercury bar, mercurous chloride bar, KCl. Okay, so KCl is the electrolyte source of chloride ions, and its concentration can be anywhere from 0.1 normal, 1 normal, or saturated KCl. Okay, so the typical calomel electrode can appear as follows, and it's very common to see this electrode in analytical electrochemical setups like pH meters or other ion selective electrodes as a reference electrode. Okay, so depending on the concentration of the KCl electrolyte, the calomel electrode will have different reduction potentials, which is actually a function of temperature as well, by the way. But for the most part, we'll be focusing on constant temperature processes, particularly those at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so overall, we could use these reduction potentials of the calomel electrode when determining the single electrode potential of an unknown electrode. So let's check out a few examples on how we can determine single electrode potentials. So when we couple electrodes of unknown known potential with our secondary reference electrode, we can calculate the unknown potential from measuring with a potentiometer the resulting cell potential. So in this particular example, we connected our calomel electrode as the cathode and our unknown electrode as the anode, okay? And the resulting cell potential is measured to be 0.6830 volts, okay? So we know earlier that the cathode potential over here, this is equal to 0.2800 volts, okay? So since we established our reference electrode as a cathode, that means this is given as our reduction potential, okay? So if we're going to be determining the potential of our anode, we'll be determining the oxidation potential. Okay, so overall, if we add up together the oxidation potential of our anode and the reduction potential of our cathode, the result is going to be our cell potential. Okay, so we could easily calculate for the unknown potential over here. Okay, so overall, we know that the oxidation potential of our cadmium cadmium 2 plus electrode at an activity of 1 for our cadmium 2 plus ions, this is just going to be equal to 0.6830 volts minus 0.2800 volts. And upon calculating this, we can determine that the oxidation potential for our cadmium cadmium 2 plus electrode is equal to 0.4030 volts. Okay, so we could also look at our second example. So in our second example, we now used our we now used our calomel electrode as an anode. Okay, but previously we already know what the reduction potential of this calomel electrode is. So we know this to be 0.2800 volts. So when we now use it as an anode, we're essentially just changing the polarities of the connections of our, of our electrode in the electrochemical cell. Okay, so that means when we want to determine the oxidation potential, this is just going to be the negative of the reduction potential. Okay, so the oxidation potential for our calomel electrode in this in these conditions 
is just given as negative 0 0.2800 volts, okay? So we are coupling this with this electrode over here, our copper copper 2 plus electrode at an activity of 1 for our copper 2 ions. So for this, we'll be determining the reduction potential of this electrode here, okay? So again, we know that upon measuring the cell potential of this electrochemical cell, we get 0 0.0570 volts, and this is just going to be the sum of the oxidation potential of our calomel electrode plus the reduction potential of our copper copper 2 plus electrode, okay? So upon calculating the reduction potential of our copper copper 2 plus electrode, this is just going to be equal to 0 0.05 70 volts, the cell potential, minus the oxidation potential of our anode. Okay, so that is given as minus negative 0 0.2800 volts. Okay, so upon calculating the reduction potential of our copper copper 2 plus electrode, this is just given as 0 0.3370 volts. Okay, so we could combine all of these calculated electrodes and set up other types of electrochemical cells, okay? So in our third example, we'll be using the single electrode potentials that we calculated for our cadmium, cadmium 2 plus electrode and our copper, copper 2 plus electrodes, okay? So we'll be determining the cell potential of this new electrochemical cell, okay? So we know that from our previous calculation in our first example that the oxidation potential of our cadmium cadmium 2 plus electrode is 0 0.40 0 0.4030 volts and we know that the reduction potential for our copper copper 2 plus electrode is 0.3370 volts so we could predict that the cell potential of our electrochemical cell is going to be 0 0.7400 volts okay so luckily, all these measurements have been done for many other half reactions, and the data is tabulated as standard reduction potentials for the reduction half reactions for species at their standard states. Okay, so recall again that the standard state for gases is one atmosphere, and the standard state for ions is an activity of one. Okay, so note that all of these reduction half potentials have been measured against she. Okay, so we could see that we have our primary reference electrode over here, she, with an established reduction potential of zero, okay? So also note some important trends, okay? So if you have a higher reduction potential, this means that there's a greater tendency for this reduction half reaction to occur, okay? So this means that you have a stronger oxidizing agent, okay? So the tendency is, of course, for it to reduce. That means it's going to most likely cause oxidation, okay? So this also means that if you have a high reduction potential, this means that you have a weaker reducing agent, so it's going to be less likely for it to be oxidized by reducing agents, okay? So just some important trends to keep in mind. So it could kind of get confusing, especially with oxidizing agent and reducing agent. But just keep in mind that if you're talking about oxidizing agents, that means that you're causing oxidation. So that means the species itself is getting reduced. Okay, same goes for reducing agents. So if you're a reducing agent, that means the species causes reduction and it itself becomes oxidized. Okay, so let's just summarize the different rules that we just discussed earlier regarding cell reactions and EMFs. Okay, so one, any cell reaction is a sum of the single electrode reactions as they occur in the cell. Okay, so as we established earlier, in the negative electrode, we have oxidation, so therefore we see the oxidation half reaction, and in the positive electrode, we see reduction. Okay, so that's where we see the reduction half reaction. Okay, so another important rule is that the total EMF is the algebraic sum of the single electrode potentials, provided that each EMF is affixed with the sign corresponding to the reaction as it actually takes place in the electrode, okay? So note that most of our data will be derived from tabulated values if we're going to be calculating for total EMFs, okay? So what we have tabulated is the standard reduction potentials, but we could easily transform that into an oxidation potential just by adding a negative sign, okay? So we're just changing the polarity of the electrode in the electrochemical cell, okay? So just always keep in mind that oxidation 
potential or the potential in the anode can be calculated from the reduction potential just by adding a negative sign. Okay, so the oxidation potential is equal to the negative of the reduction potential for that particular half reaction. Okay, so another important thing to keep in mind is that single electrode potentials are intensive properties. Okay, so that means that regardless of the stoichiometry of the reaction, so say that we multiply a half reaction by two, the single electrode potential will remain the same. Okay, so for example, if we're dealing with a reduction half reaction that involves some metal of 2 plus charge and this involves two electrons and this results in the formation of M solid, okay, so and this has a corresponding standard reduction potential for example or any other reduction potential. If we multiply this reaction, this half reaction by 2, so we have M2 plus plus 4 electrons yielding 2m solid, okay, so the reduction potential for this half reaction is going to be the same thing, okay? So it's an intensive property, so the size of the half reaction does not matter, okay? So keep in mind these rules, so we'll be using all of these rules in our later discussion when we start looking at different types of electrodes and different types of electrochemical cells. All right, so before we proceed to that, however, let's look at the relationship between thermodynamics and the electromotive force, okay? So we want to get a relationship between potential and Gibbs free energy, okay? So let's consider the net electrical work done by a reaction with a certain potential and supplying a quantity of electricity Q. Okay, so keep in mind again that when we're constructing a galvanic cell, for example, we're producing electricity, a flow of electrons through our circuit. So this is essentially electrical work. Okay, so our net electrical work in joules, this is just equal to the charge involved times the potential. This is just going to be equal to Q, the charge involved, times E, which is the cell potential. Okay, so we could elaborate what this Q is, right? So keep in mind that we're dealing with electrons, and we know that for every electron, we have one Faraday of current produced, okay? So a Faraday, this is equal to 96485 coulombs per mole electron, okay? So for a, a particular reaction, we'll be involving n number of electron moles per mole reaction. Okay, so that means for every mole of reaction, the net electrical work can be calculated as NFE, where NF, this is equal to your Q, okay? So we just multiply our Faraday's constant, which tells us the charge per mole of electron, by the number of moles of electrons per mole of reaction. Okay, so we could relate the net electrical work in our reaction by recalling the definition of Gibbs free energy. Okay, so this net electrical work, this is the work done by the system. So we could affix a negative sign just for convention's sake. And recall again that we define Gibbs free energy as a total non pressure volume work done by the system. Okay, so that means this work done by the system, which is negative NFE. This is essentially our Gibbs free energy change of our system. Okay, so this equation is very important because it relates thermodynamic parameters such as Gibbs free energy with electrochemistry. Okay, so we know that the net electrical work done by the reaction is just given by negative NF times the cell potential. Okay, so we can see that this is consistent with our earlier analysis. So we know that if our delta G is less than zero, right, we have a spontaneous reaction. Okay, so if we have a delta G that's less than zero, we see that it, this corresponds to a potential that is greater than zero. Okay, so again, this corresponds to a galvanic cell. Okay, so when, however, our delta G is greater than zero or it's positive, this means that our cell potential is less than zero. So this corresponds to a non spontaneous process or an electrolytic cell. Okay, so we also know that when delta G is equal to zero, this means that our cell potential is equal to zero as well. Okay, so let's expand on what happens at equilibrium for a 
redox reacting system. Okay, so let's recall the relationship between delta G and our reaction quotient. So delta G is equal to delta G naught plus RT ln Q. Okay, so again, we know that delta G, this is equal to negative NFE. So delta G naught, this is just going to be equal to negative NF times the standard cell potential. Okay, so this is calculated from our standard reduction potentials. Okay, so this is the potential that corresponds to when our species are all at standard conditions. Okay, so let's make the corresponding replacements of delta G and delta G naught. So this is going to be equal to negative NFE is equal to negative NFE naught plus RT ln Q. Okay, so if we divide the whole equation by 1 over negative nf, this will give us E, the cell potential, is equal to the standard cell potential minus RT over nf ln q. Okay, so this equation over here, this is known as your Nernst equation. Okay, so like our initial equation over here, this just relates our cell potential with Q. Okay, so Q corresponds to the actual activities or concentrations of our species in a given system. Okay, so again, at equilibrium, we know that delta G is going to be equal to zero. So this also means that our cell potential is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so overall we have zero is equal to E naught minus RT over NF LN. Okay, so our Q, this is going to be equal to our equilibrium constant K. Okay, so this gives us a relationship between standard cell potential and our corresponding equilibrium constant. Okay, so our standard cell potential, this is going to be equal to RT over NF LN K. Alright, so this gives us a relationship again between our standard cell potential and our corresponding equilibrium constant for our system. Okay, so other important thermodynamic parameters include considering what our entropy and our enthalpy of our reaction will be with respect to our, our cell potential. Okay, so again, starting from our basic relationship of delta G, is equal to negative NFE. Okay, so let's just recall that the change in delta G with respect to temperature at constant pressure, this is equal to negative delta S. Okay, so we could get a relationship between delta S and our potential by replacing our delta G with negative NFE. Okay, so we have partial of negative NFE over partial of T at constant P is equal to negative delta S. Okay, so simplifying this equation, this becomes negative NF. Okay, so these are two constants. So we could take it out of the derivative. So this is negative NF partial of E with respect to T at constant pressure. So this is equal to negative delta S. Okay, so we have negative signs on both sides of the equation. So this ultimately simplifies to NF partial of E with respect to T at constant P. This is equal to delta S. Okay, so this gives us the relationship of entropy change for our system with our potential. So this derivative over here, this tells us the variation of our potential with temperature. So this is just known as our temperature coefficient. Okay, so this is expected to have the units of volts per temperature. All right, so with this relationship of delta S and delta G, okay, so we could derive an expression for delta H using the relationships that we know already. Okay, so we know that delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So rearranging this, this gives us delta H is equal to delta G plus T delta S. Okay, so we already know the relationships of delta G and delta S with our potential. So we could just make the corresponding replacement. So delta H, this is equal to negative NFE. And over here we have plus temperature times the equation for delta S. So that is just equal to NF 
partial of E with respect to T at constant pressure. Okay, so just simplifying this equation, we have delta H is equal to NF times the quantity T times partial of E with respect to T at constant P minus E. Okay, so this is our rather lengthy equation for delta H. But keep in mind again that these are just derived from our basic equations of delta G is equal to negative NFE. So let's apply all of these equations in order to solve our next problem over here. So we're given this electrochemical cell with this corresponding cell diagram and we're also given the standard EMF of this cell, which is determined to be 0.5359 volts. We're also given this, the corresponding temperature coefficient at 298.15 Kelvin. So we want to determine first the cell reaction and then the values of delta G naught, KEQ, delta H naught, and delta S naught. Okay, so the first things first, it's useful to determine the cell reaction. Okay, so over here we know that we have the anode. And over here, we also have the cathode. Okay, so hopefully you recognize the cathode as our calomel electrode. Okay, so it looks like in this particular cell, we have some, we have a shared electrolyte, and that electrolyte is our KCl. Okay, so let's write down our anode reaction. Okay, so as written over here, this really helps us determine what the balanced chemical equation is. Okay, so we know that our lead appears first, okay, and then we end up forming PBCl2 solid. Okay, so this means we need to have some chloride ions in our reactant side. And in order to balance out the charges, we end up losing two electrons in the process. Okay, so this is our oxidation reaction over here. Okay, so we can see that it's nicely balanced in terms of our atoms and the corresponding charges. Okay, so our cathode on the other hand, this is just our calomel electrode. Okay, so we could just write this as our calomel plus two electrons yielding our two mercury plus two chloride. Right, so this is our corresponding half reaction. So upon adding these two reactions together, okay, so it's important to note that the reaction they'll be writing as written will be involving two electrons. So we have lead solid plus our calomel. Okay, so note as well that our two chloride ions also cancel out. So this yields PBCl2 solid plus two mercury. Okay, so this is the cell reaction and again note that we involve two electrons. Okay, so first we want to determine our standard gives free energy. So we know that this is equal to delta G naught is equal to negative NF E naught. Okay, so our E naught is just given over here. Okay, so our standard EMF is 0.5359 volts. So that means our delta G naught, this is equal to, okay, so number of moles of electrons involved. So this is two moles of electrons for the reaction as written over here times Faraday's constant, so 96485 coulombs per mole electrons times the corresponding standard EMF, so that is 0 0.5359 volts. Okay, so keep in mind, mole electrons, mole electrons cancels out. Coulombs times volts, that is equal to joules. So our delta G naught, this is equal to negative 103.4 times 10 to the 3 joules per mole of reaction as written. Okay, so we can just set this as negative 103.4 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so this is our delta G naught. All right, so we could also calculate for KEQ. Okay, so let's recall the relationship between KEQ and our delta G naught. Okay, so again, there's several ways to calculate this. You could calculate our KEQ from our standard cell potential, or since we just calculated our delta G naught, we could also use our delta G naught value. Okay, so let's just move on to some extra free space over here. So we know that KEQ, this is just going to be equal to the exponential of negative delta G naught over RT. Okay, so this is going to be given as 
e raised to negative negative 103.4 times 10 to the 3 joules per mole of reaction divided by r so that is 8.314 joules per mole kelvin times the temperature which is given as 298.15 kelvin okay so upon calculating this our equilibrium constant is just equal to 1.313 times 10 raised to 18. Okay, so that is our corresponding equilibrium constant. So next we want to calculate delta H naught and delta S naught. So it's probably more useful to calculate for delta S naught first. Okay, so delta S naught, this is just going to be equal to NF times the corresponding temperature coefficient, so that is partial of E, with respect to T at constant pressure. Okay, so we're just given the temperature coefficient over here. So our number of moles of electrons, that is 2 moles of electrons, times Faraday's constant, so 96485 coulombs per mole electron, times our temperature coefficient, so that is 1.45, times 10 to the negative 4 volts per Kelvin. Okay, so over here we know that moles of electrons cancels out, coulombs times volt, that's joules. So our final units will be joules per Kelvin as expected. Okay, so this is go going to be 27.98 joules per mole Kelvin. All right, so that is our delta S naught. So now that we know delta S naught, and we also previously calculated delta G, okay, so we could just directly calculate delta H from our relationship of delta H naught is equal to delta G naught minus T delta S naught, okay? So this is just equal to negative 103.4 kilojoules per mole reaction minus temperature, so that is 298.15 Kelvin times R Delta S naught, let's, so let's just put it in kilojoules, so this is 27.98 times 10 to the negative 3 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. So ultimately, our delta H naught, this is equal to negative 111.7 kilojoules per mole. All right. So overall, this is the way that we could calculate the different thermodynamic parameters of an electrochemical cell. Okay, so note again that all of these equations were pretty much derived from our basic equations. Okay, so we know all of the equations that we used before. So the only thing that was new was our relationship between delta G and potential. Okay, so all of the equations that we used again were just derived from this basic relationship between thermodynamics and electrochemistry. All right, okay, so now let's move on to investigating different types of electrodes. Okay, so we'll be investigating these different types of electrodes more closely and then later on we'll be looking at how we could connect these different electrodes to form different types of electrochemical cells. Okay, so first we'll be discussing the basic metal metal ion electrodes and from this basic setup we could actually derive different types of electrodes including amalgam electrodes and metal insoluble salt electrodes. Okay, so we also have gas electrodes. So an example of a gas electrode is our standard hydrogen electrode and we could also have oxidation reduction electrodes. Alright, so again the most basic type of electrode is the metal metal ion electrode. So in general it's just made up of a metal electrode in contact with a solution of its own ions. Okay, so over here we have the general reduction half reaction for this equation and we also have the corresponding Nernst equation for the reduction potential of this electrode. Okay, so no throughout our discussion of electrodes we'll be focusing on the reduction potential and the corresponding reduction half reaction. Okay, so we just so okay, so if you just want to look at the oxidation process, we just need to flip over the reaction and we also just need to add a negative sign to our standard reduction potentials. Okay, so an example of a metal metal ion electrode would be our zinc zinc 2 plus electrode. Okay, so based on its balanced chemical equation, we could write down the corresponding Nernst equation. So that's just going to be the reduction potential is equal to the standard reduction potential minus RT over 2. Okay, so our, so our equation involves two electrons times F times LN, the activity of our zinc solid over the activity of our zinc 
ions, okay? So note again that most of the time, our solid components will just have an activity of 1, okay? So for the most part, for simplicity, we could just omit the solid part over here, okay? But later on, we'll see how we could actually change the activity of a solid, which will also lead to the change in reduction potential of the electrode, okay? So one way that we could actually do that is through amalgams, okay? So, so an amalgam is actually just a solid solution of the metal in mercury, okay? So instead of using the pure metal in a metal-metal ion electrode, we could substitute the pure metal with an amalgam, okay? So the advantages of this is that our amalgam electrode becomes more readily reversible and you also get more satisfactory reproducible results since the main problem with metal metal ion electrodes is the issue of impurity but since we diluted our metal in mercury the dilution of the metal also results in the dilution of impurities okay so overall amalgam electrodes tend to be a little bit more reproducible okay so again the corresponding half reaction is actually just the same as our metal metal ion electrode but we just have to keep in mind that our solid in this case is a solid solution now okay so the corresponding Nernst equation for the reduction potential of our amalgam electrode is as follows but an additional caution that we just have to keep in mind when we consider amalgam electrodes is that this part over here the activity of our metal is not equal to one since it is now diluted in the amalgam okay so this value over here this is going to be less than one okay so since we now decrease the activity of our metal this will lead to a corresponding decrease in the corresponding reduction potential if we have an amalgam electrode okay so an example of an amalgam electrode is the lead lead 2 plus electrode okay so here's the corresponding half reaction and here's a corresponding Nernst equation for this okay so again keep in mind that this is not equal to unity okay but overall, an important thing to keep in mind is that our standard reduction potential, this is equal to the standard reduction potential of our pure lead electrode. Okay, so another type of electrode that is derived from your basic metal-metal ion electrode is the metal insoluble salt electrode. Okay, so this is pretty much just made up of a metal in contact with its insoluble salt and a solution containing the ion present in the salt other than the metal, okay? So the major use of, ins of the insoluble salt is that it lowers the concentration of the metal cation in solution, therefore altering the stability of the ions with respect to reduction, okay? So later on, we'll be looking at the effect of precipitation on our reduction potential. So this is actually just an application of that. So examples of metal insoluble salt electrodes include our calomel electrode, our silver silver chloride electrode, our lead lead sulfate electrode, and our silver silver bromide electrode. Okay, so let's check out an example of an of a metal insoluble salt electrode. So here we have our silver silver chloride electrode. So here's the corresponding balanced half reaction. Okay, so keep in mind that this type of electrode is actually in very common use nowadays so it's used as a reference electrode in pH meters okay so in this particular example we have our metal which is our silver in contact with its insoluble salt in this case silver chloride and a solution containing the other ion namely our chloride ions okay so the corresponding Nernst equation of this is just given as follows okay so we have our activity of our chloride ions times the activity of our silver and the activity of our silver chloride okay but again for the most part this is equal to one and this is also equal to one okay so we could see here that the reduction potential is mostly just sensitive to chloride ion concentration Okay, so a next type of electrode is the gas electrode. So actually, we've seen an example of this earlier. So overall, for a gas electrode, you have a gas bubbling about an inert metal wire immersed in a solution of ions in which the gas is reversible. Okay, so the most common example of this is, again, the hydrogen electrode. Okay, so note that an important part of gas electrode is the addition of the inert metal wire. So in this particular case, it is platinum. So the major use 
of platinum is just to facilitate the establishment of equilibrium between the gas and its ions, and it also just serves as an electrical contact for the electrode. Okay, so the metal itself doesn't isn't really involved directly with the half reaction of the electrode. Okay, so in this particular case. The Nernst equation for the reduction potential is just the activity of our hydrogen gas over the activity of our hydrogen ion squared. Okay, so here we have an illustration of the gas electrode. Okay, so again, just note that our our platinum just serves as a surface upon which the corresponding half reaction of the electrode occurs. So our last type of basic electrode also makes use of inert metal surface, and that is our oxidation reduction electrodes. Okay? So in these electrodes, the EMF results from the presence of ions of a substance in two different stages of oxidation. Okay? So again, the inert metal surface just serves as an electrical contact of the electrode. Okay, so a very common example of this is the ferrospheric ion electrode. Okay, so the corresponding half reaction is that we have ferric ions gaining electrons in order to form your ferrous ion. So the corresponding Nernst equation for the reduction potential is just given as follows. So, okay, so again, these are just different types of electrodes that we might encounter in our study of electrochemistry. So... Let's now look at the different ways in which the potentials of these electrodes can vary with the cell conditions, okay? So just keep in mind again, as we could probably see from just the Nernst equation, the reduction potentials of our, of our electrodes as well as our cells are highly dependent on different conditions, okay? So one, as you can see from the Nernst equation, it's very dependent on the concentration of species, the pH conditions, as well as complexation or precipitation reactions that might occur, okay? So let's check out the first condition and that is when we vary the concentration or, or activity of our species in our electrode. Okay, so as an example, let's consider the zinc 2 plus zinc half cell. Okay, so here's a corresponding reduction half reaction, and the corresponding Nernst equation is also given as follows. So again, for the most part, we'll be treating the activity of our zinc solid as 1. Okay? The standard conditions is also when the activity of our zinc ions is also equal to 1. So we could investigate what happens when we decrease the concentration or activity of our species in solution. Okay, So let's say that we have conditions in which our zinc ion concentration, which, which we can approximate as our activity, is equal to 0 0.10 molar. Okay, so note that the standard reduction potential for this half cell is negative 0.76. So if we replace the activity of our zinc 2 plus ions with the corresponding concentration over here, we get this potential over here. Okay, so the potential of this half cell, so the potential of this electrode, as we have a decreased activity of zinc ions, we see that we also have a decrease in reduction potential. Okay, so overall it just becomes harder to reduce our zinc ions upon decreasing the concentration of our zinc. Okay, but note guys that the effect of changing the concentration of a particular species is always going to be reaction dependent. Okay, so our next condition is highly related to this as well, okay, and that is the variation of pH conditions, okay? So for illustrative purposes, let's look at the effect of changing pH if we have a system involving permanganate. Okay, so the reduction potential of permanganate is a very high value, so we have plus 1.51 as our reduction potential, so this tells us that permanganate is a very strong oxidizing agent, okay? So we can see the effect of pH on this system if we make sure that we balance this half reaction. So let's just recall how we could balance redox reactions, and in this case we're just going to be balancing our half reaction. So overall we have four oxygens over here, so we add four water, and in order to balance out the number of hydrogens that we just added, we just add eight H plus ions. And in order to balance out the charges, okay, so on this side we have 2 plus, on this side we have plus 7, so here we need to add 5 electrons, okay? So if we make sure that we completely balance 
the half reaction, we could definitely see that the system is dependent on pH. Okay, so that means the Nernst equation for the reduction potential of our system is given as follows. Okay, so we have the standard reduction potential minus RT over 5F. Okay, so 5 moles of electrons per mole of reaction as written times LN, okay, activity of R manganese 2 ions over the activity of our H plus ions raised to 8 times the activity of our permanganate. Okay, so if we isolate the activity of our H plus ions, okay, so this will be, be written as reduction potential is equal to standard reduction potential minus RT over 5F ln of the activity of R manganese ions over activity of our permanganate plus the plus RT over 5F LN activity of H plus ions raised to 8. Okay, so overall, if we increase the activity of our H plus ions, okay, so this corresponds to, of course, a decrease in pH. If we increase this value over here, this will lead to an increase in this entire expression and overall lead to an increase in our reduction potential, okay? So overall, at lower pH, in this particular case, we see that we have a higher reduction potential, okay? So overall, this implies that at lower pHs or higher H plus ion concentration, our permanganate has greater oxidizing power, okay? So this has several implications, especially in terms of experimental conditions that need to be satisfied whenever we're using permanganate ions as an oxidizing agent, okay? So for example, if we want to use permanganate as an oxidizing agent in the oxidation of chloride ions, we see that nothing really happens in neutral solution, but if we use highly acidic conditions and we have chloride ions in solution, this is when we could actually see the liberation of chlorine gas, okay? So overall, the oxidizing power of permanganate is greater in more acidic solutions. So overall, in order to investigate the effect of pH, it's important to be able to balance the corresponding half reaction in order to see where our H plus ions might be involved in our equation. Okay, so our next effect of interest is complexation and precipitation, okay? But before we get into this, let's just look at this particular system over here, okay? So we have the reduction of silver ions to form silver solid, and this has a corresponding reduction potential of 0.80 volts, okay? So... Let's just investigate the effect of decreasing the silver, the concentration of silver ions on the potential of our silver-silver ion electrode. Okay, so this is very similar to our analysis of what happens when we decrease the concentration of zinc ions in solution. Okay, so if we analyze the reduction potential of our system upon decreasing the concentration of silver ions, okay, so upon reduction of the activity of our silver ions, we see that this will ultimately have the effect of decreasing our reduction potential, okay? So overall, our silver ions become harder to reduce at lower concentrations, okay? So a low concentration of silver ions can be achieved by dilution or an alternative approach is to remove silver ions via the formation of a complex or a precipitate, okay? So one way that we could form a precipitate is to add potassium chloride into our cell. This will ultimately lead to the precipitation of our silver ions to form our silver chloride precipitate, okay? So if we add these two reactions together, we get a new half reaction, okay? So we can see here that our silver ions cancel out and we have our silver chloride solid plus one electron forming silver solid and our chloride ions, okay? So hopefully this half reaction is familiar to you guys because this is an example of a metal insoluble salt electrode.
okay? So to be more specific, this is our silver silver chloride electrode, okay? So hopefully now you could see how this type of electrode is actually just a variation of the basic metal metal ion electrode, okay? So again, our silver silver chloride electrode is just based from our silver ion silver electrode and we just added chloride ions so that the concentration of our silver ions remain low via precipitation, okay? So a next interesting thing that we want to calculate then is what the re standard reduction potential of this new half reaction might be, okay? So say that we already know the standard reduction potential of our original metal-metal ion half reaction. So now we want to figure out what the metal insoluble salt half reaction potential might be, okay? So we're also given the KSP over here, okay? So an important thing to note about potentials, however, is that they are intensive properties and that they are non-state functions, okay? So that means you can't directly use Hess's law in order to calculate the standard reduction potential for a reaction of interest. But what we do know, however, is that we could convert our potentials to other state functions such as delta G or our equilibrium constant. Okay, so in this particular case, it's probably more useful to convert our standard reduction potential to an equilibrium constant. Okay, so that means that the equilibrium constant of this half reaction is just going to be the equilibrium constant of our reaction 1 times the KSP of our precipitation reaction over here. Okay, so from our earlier discussion relating thermodynamics and cell potential, we already know the equation that relates standard potential with our equilibrium constant. Okay, so this is just equal to K is equal to E raised to NF E naught over RT. Okay, so if we calculate the equilibrium constant for this half reaction, this is just equal to K is equal to 3.34 times 10 raised to 13. Okay, so this is our K1 in this expression over here. Okay, so that means our equilibrium constant for this half reaction down here, this is just equal to 3.34 times 10 raised to 13 times 1.77 times 10 raised to negative 10, and that is equal to... 5909. Okay, so we could convert this back to our standard reduction potential using this equation over here. So we know that E naught is equal to RT over NF ln K. Okay, so we know that R, this is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Our temperature, let's just use the usual temperature of 298.15 Kelvin over number of moles of electrons per mole of reaction. So that is 1 and our Faraday's constant. Okay, so we get input our value for K over here. And our standard reduction potential for this half reaction over here, this is going to be given as positive 0 0.22 volts. Okay, so if we refer to our standard reduction potential tables, this value here is actually consistent with what's tabulated. Okay, so just to reiterate, our potentials are not state functions. So if we want to get the potential of a reaction derived from two other reactions, we need to convert our potentials to another state function such as Gibbs free energy or equilibrium constant and reconvert the value back to potential. All right, okay, so another strategy for decreasing the concentration of silver ions is also through complexation, okay? So one way that we could modify our system is instead of adding potassium chloride, we could add potassium iodide, okay? So actually the effect of adding potassium iodide is that we tend to form a complex with our silver ions, okay? So in this particular example, our silver ions in our half reaction over here is being consumed via the formation of this complex over here, okay? So if you want to get the net reaction, okay, so let's just rewrite some of our equations, okay? So we have silver ion plus one electron yielding silver solid 
Okay, so the corresponding equilibrium constant for this, as we calculated earlier, is equal to 3.34 times 10 raised to 13. And let's just write down the reverse of this reaction. So this is our complex yielding silver ions plus three iodide ions. So the corresponding K for this will be the inverse of the formation constant, so that is equal to 1 over 1.00 times 10 to the 14. So overall, the net reaction is, okay, so our silver ions cancel out. So we have our complex plus one electron yielding silver solid plus three iodide ions. All right, so the equilibrium constant for this equation over here, this half reaction, is just going to be K1 times K2, or 3.34 times 10 to the 13 over 1.00 times 10 to the 14. So that is equal to 0 0.334. Okay, so we could get the corresponding standard reduction potential by calculating RT over NF LN 0.334. So keep in mind here that the number of moles of electrons per mole of reaction is just equal to 1. So our standard reduction potential for this reaction over here, this is equal to 0.028 volts. All right. Okay, so we can see here that the standard reduction potential became lower than our original metal-metal ion half reaction here. Okay, so this is due to the fact that we decrease the concentration of our silver ions by complexing it with iodide. So with this in mind, we could calculate the standard reduction potential for other types of half reactions. So for example, in this problem over here, we want to determine the standard reduction potential of this reaction given the following information over here. Okay, so we know the standard reduction potential of cobalt-3 to form cobalt-2, and we also know the corresponding formation constants of our complexes here. Okay, so recall again that the key for this particular type of problem is to convert our reduction potential into an equilibrium constant, and then getting the equilibrium constant for this particular half reaction, and then converting it to a standard reduction potential. Okay, so let's just write down the equations that we need to add in order to get this as our net reaction. Okay, so first and foremost, we need to involve our cobalt-3 half reaction. Okay, so if we calculate the corresponding equilibrium constant, that is going to be equal to E raised to NF E naught over RT. Okay, so our number of moles of electrons per mole of reaction as written is just equal to 1. And of course, our temperature is 25 degrees Celsius or 298.15 K. So upon calculating this, this becomes 2.86 times 10 raised to 32, okay? So we just use our standard reduction potential over here, okay? So next we need to add together our second reaction that is reversed, okay? So this will give us hexaamine cobalt-3 resulting in cobalt-3 plus 6 ammonia. Okay, so the e corresponding equilibrium constant for this will be the inverse of the formation constant. Okay, so we have 1 over 4.6 times 10 raised to 33. Okay, so the next reaction that we need to add is just this third reaction as written. Okay, so this is going to be cobalt 2 plus 6 ammonia forming our hexaamine cobalt 2. Right? Okay, so the corresponding equilibrium constant for this expression is just the Kf expression as is. So that is 8.3 times 10 raised to 4. Right? So upon adding all these equations, we could see that our, okay, so first here we see our cobalt 3 canceling out. Okay, so here we have our cobalt 2 canceling out, and we also have our 6 ammonia canceling out. Okay, so our net reaction is, as expected, our hexaamine cobalt-3 
plus one electron, yielding our hexaamine cobalt two. Okay, so that is the desired reaction as written over here. Okay, so the equilibrium constant for this is just K1 times K2 times K3. And if we calculate this, this is just equal to 5161. Okay, so we want to convert this to a standard reduction potential, right? So that is just equal to E0 is equal to RT over NF, okay, so again, our R is just 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Our temperature is 298.15K. Our number of moles of electrons per mole of reaction as written is 1, and our Faraday's constant is 96485 coulombs per mole electron. And we just multiply this by the LN of our K, so that is 5161. Okay, so upon calculation, our standard reduction potential for the reaction of interest is equal to positive 0 0.220 volts. All right, so this is the general strategy for determining the potentials of different reactions based on the equilibrium constants of different precipitation or complexation reactions and the corresponding potential of the half reaction. Okay, so now that we've looked at different types of electrodes and we've also discussed the variations of reduction potential with different cell conditions, we can now put all these things together in order co to construct different types of electrochemical cells. So electrochemical cells can be divided into two major types. Okay, so the first type is your basic chemical cell. Okay, so by definition, a chemical cell is one in which potential arises due to a chemical reaction occurring in the cell. Okay, so that means you have your typical redox reaction involving a different species that gets oxidized and a different species that gets reduced, okay? So the other type, on the other hand, is a concentration cell. So by definition, a concentration cell is one in which potential arises due to a concentration difference, therefore resulting in a transfer of matter. Later on, we'll see what makes a concentration cell special and what are the requirements in order to construct a concentration cell, okay? So these two types of basic cells can also be further subdivided into two other types, namely one with transference and one without transference, okay? So whenever we talk about transference, this is when we have the involvement of a salt bridge, okay? So if we have a chemical cell without transference, that means we have no salt bridge involved. So that means we have a single solution in which our electrodes are dipped, okay? But if we start involving transference, that means we have two separate solutions that make up our electrodes and they have to be connected with a salt bridge, okay? So later on, we'll see what the effect of a salt bridge will have on the corresponding cell potential of our electrochemical cell. Okay, so first let's discuss a chemical cell without transference. Okay, so here is a basic schematic. Okay, so as we discussed earlier, since we have no transference involved, that means we have no salt bridge, and therefore we have no so-called liquid junction. Okay, so overall, our, both of our electrodes are dipped in the same solution with an electrolyte. Okay, so this electrolyte ha has to be very specific, actually. So the ions of the electrolyte have to be involved in the oxidation half reaction, and the other ion has to be involved in the reduction half reaction. Okay, so let's check out an example to make this a little bit more concrete. Okay, so in this particular example, we have our hydrogen electrode set as our anode and our silver silver chloride electrode set as our cathode. Okay, so in our particular example, the common electrolyte or the solution in which our electrodes are dipped is HCl. Okay, so we could see here that our H plus ions, these are the ones involved in our anode half reaction, and our chloride ions in our common electrolyte, this is the, 
This is the ion involved in our cathode half reaction. Okay, so let's just write out our anode half reaction. We see that we have the oxidation of our hydrogen gas to form H plus ions. And we also have the corresponding cathode half reaction. Okay, so we have our silver chloride forming silver solid and our chloride ions. Okay, so if we add these two things together, we get our net reaction. Okay. But it's also important to keep in mind that since we're dealing with a single solution, we could rewrite our H plus and our chloride ions as just HCl, which has a common activity of HCl. All right. Okay, so this will also give us our standard cell potential, which is just equal to the sum of the reduction potential of our silver silver chloride electrode and the oxidation potential of our standard hydrogen electrode right but since this is equal to zero we could say that our e cell is just equal to the standard reduction potential of our silver silver chloride electrode Okay, so the major application of chemical cells without transference is the calculation of, of standard reduction potentials. Okay, so for example, in this particular case, if we have all our species in standard conditions, the measurement of our standard cell potential would be equal to the standard reduction potential of our silver silver chloride electrode. Okay, so another major application is the determination of mean activity coefficients. So since we're dealing with a single electrolyte solution and our H plus ions and our chloride ions are derived from a single species, which is HCl, that means their activity coefficients can be approximated using the mean activity coefficient, okay? So let's write out the Nernst equation for this. This is E, the cell potential is equal to the standard cell potential minus RT over F, okay? So N is equal to one in this case times ln activity of H plus ions times activity of chloride ions times the activity of our silver over the activity of our silver chloride times the activity of our hydrogen gas squared. Okay, so if we establish our cell conditions as having an activity of hydrogen gas at one atmosphere, over the standard pressure of one atmosphere. So overall, we have an activity of one. Okay, so this becomes one, and the activity of our solids are also equal to one. So overall, our equation simplifies to the activity of H plus ions times the activity of chloride ions. Okay, so let's focus on this part for a little bit. Okay, so this will give us ln activity of H plus ions. So if we expand that, we have the mean activity coefficient times times the concentration of H plus ions over the standard concentration of one molar times the mean activity coefficient, this is for your chloride ions, times the concentration of chloride ions over one molar. Okay, so this will ultimately be the ln of mean activity coefficient squared times concentration of H plus plus ions times the concentration of chloride ions, okay? But keep in mind, however, that since our H plus ions and our chloride ions are from the same chemical species, okay, so the concentration of HCl, this will just be equal to the concentration of H plus ions and the concentration of chloride ions, okay? So we could rewrite this as ln of mean activity coefficient squared times the concentration of HCl squared. Okay, so just to include our standard state, okay, so one molar squared as well. Okay, so ultimately our equation is going to be cell potential is equal to standard cell potential minus RT over F times LN mean activity coefficient squared times the concentration of HCl squared over one molar squared, our standard state. Okay, so we could actually apply this equation for our next problem. Okay, so in this next problem over here, we're dealing with the electrochemical cell that we talked about earlier, and we set a concentration of HCl to be 0.1238 molar, and the measured cell potential is equal to 0.3420 volts at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so we're also given the standard reduction potential of our silver silver chloride electrode. Okay, so with this, keep in mind earlier that we said that the standard cell potential, this is just going to be equal to the standard reduction potential of our silver silver chloride 
half reaction plus the oxidation potential of our Xi. But since this is established to be zero, our standard cell potential is just equal to the standard reduction potential of our silver silver chloride electrode, okay? So overall, let's just rewrite the equation derived earlier, okay? So this is our cell potential, which will be equal to this value over here, is equal to the standard cell potential minus RT over F, LN mean activity coefficient squared, times HCl squared over 1 molar squared. Okay, so in this particular problem, we're given the measured cell potential, the standard cell potential, and we're also given the concentration of our HCl solution, okay, which is 0 0.1238 molar. Okay, so with all these values given, we could easily calculate for the mean activity coefficient of our HCl solution. Okay, so this is just going to be equal to 0.3420 volts is equal to 0.2202 volts minus 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin times 298.15 Kelvin over 1 mole of electrons times 96485 coulombs per mole electron times ln mean activity coefficient squared times 0 0.1238 over 1 molar squared. Okay, so we could just solve for our mean activity coefficient and this is equal to 0 0.755. Okay, so this offers us a method in order to experimentally measure our mean activity coefficients of our solutions. Okay, so now let's look at what happens when we do have transference. Okay, so for a chemical cell with transference, this implies that we now have a liquid junction between our solutions of different electrolytes. Okay, so recall again from our notation for chemical cells, that if we have a double line in between our electrodes, this corresponds to a salt bridge, okay? So presence of a salt bridge actually contributes to the overall cell potential of our electrochemical cell, okay? So aside from the potential of the cathode and the potential in the anode, we have a third potential over here, which is E sub J. So this is known as your junction potential. Okay, so this is the potential that arises from non-ideal transfer of our ions across our salt bridge. Okay, so sometimes the movement of the cation, for example, is faster than that of the anion. Okay, so there ends up being a slight charge difference between our two electrons. Electrodes, okay, so this can this can also lead to the formation of a potential difference, which will ultimately contribute to our overall cell potential. Okay, so the problem with junction potentials is that they cannot be determined separately. Okay, so that means so that means there is some unknown factor that contributes to our experimental results over here. Okay, so let's check out the contribution of a junction potential in our Daniel cell. So ideally, in order to reduce the junction potential, we could use electrolytes with ions of equal velocities. Okay, so for example, we could use, for example, we could use potassium chloride or potassium nitrate. Okay, but of course, there's still going to be some variation in the velocities of these ions, and there's still going to be some separation of charges with our salt bridge. So there's still going to be some junction potential that might be observed for our electrochemical cell, okay? In addition, we'll also note some important differences with a chemical cell with transference in terms of activity coefficients for our electrolytes, okay? So let's consider our Daniel cell again. So if we write out the Nernst equation for this, this is going to be the cell potential is equal to the standard cell potential plus RT over... 2F, okay, so 2 moles of electrons per mole of reaction times LN of the activity of our zinc ions over the activity of our copper ions, okay? So we're just going to be omitting the activity of our solid components, okay? So if we expand the expression of our activities, okay, so the activity of our zinc, this is going to be the activity coefficient of our zinc 
times the concentration of our zinc ions over the standard concentration and the activity of our copper is going to be the activity coefficient of our copper ions times the concentration of copper ions over one molar okay so it's important to note here that in contrast to our chemical cell without transference the activity coefficient of our zinc and the activity coefficient of our copper ions Okay, so they will be different from one another and, and they must be determined separately. Okay, so we cannot use mean activity coefficient because they are in separate solutions now. Okay, so we can only use mean activity coefficient if we're dealing with an electrolyte in the same solution. Okay, so upon expansion of this, we have cell potential is equal to standard cell potential plus RT over 2F times ln activity coefficient of zinc times concentration of zinc over one molar over activity coefficient of copper times concentration of copper over one molar okay so with so in chemical cells with transference it won't be feasible to calculate what this is Okay, so lastly, let's look now at concentration cells. Okay, so in our discussion, we'll just be limiting ourselves to a discussion of concentration cells without transference. Okay, so again, as mentioned earlier, for concentration cells, the EMF arises due to a transfer of material from one electrode to the other due to a concentration difference between the two. Okay, so an example of a concentration cell will be a hydrogen electrode coupled with itself. Okay, so the principle behind concentration cells is that you'll always have the same type of electrode coupled with one another. But in this particular case, you have to make sure that the concentration of one species is different. Okay, so in this particular example, we have our hydrogen gas at different pressures for our anode versus our cathode, okay? So let's write down the half reactions involved here, okay? So the anode half reaction is the oxidation of hydrogen gas, okay? So keep in mind that this is going to be at pressure 1, and then the cathode half reaction is just the reduction of H plus ions, okay? So if we get the net reaction for this, okay, so a lot of things actually cancel out, right? Okay, so this cancels out, this cancels out, this cancels out, this cancels out, okay? So ultimately, you just have hydrogen gas at pressure 1 forming hydrogen gas at pressure 2, okay? So ultimately, you just have like a movement of matter, okay? So from pressure 1, you have a transfer to pressure 2, okay? So again, the standard cell potential Okay, so since we're dealing with the same potentials over here, okay, so this is going to be equal to zero, okay? So we can see here that the potential does not really arise from a chemical reaction, but rather from a movement of matter from one electrode to the other. So an important note here as well, guys, is that this concentration cell is made without transference because we have a common electrolyte solution between these two electrodes okay so the common electrolyte is just our h plus ions here so we have the same activity of h plus here same activity of h plus here so you pretty much just have two hydrogen electrodes that are dipped in a solution containing some amount of hydrogen plus ions Okay, so let's consider the Nernst equation for this. Okay, so the Nernst equation for this particular process in terms of just pressures is, is given as the cell potential is equal to the standard cell potential minus RT over 2F times ln of pressure 2 over pressure 1. Okay, but since again, as we mentioned earlier, we have the same type of electrodes for our anode and cathode, this means that our standard cell potential is always going to be equal to zero because the oxidation potentials and the reduction potentials of our anode and cathode respectively are always going to be canceling out, okay? So this is always going to be equal to zero. So therefore, the potential is just going to be dependent on the variation in pressures in one electrode versus the other electrode. Okay, so for simplification, we just wrote out the cell potential as RT over 2F times ln P1 over P2. Okay, so we just incorporated this negative sign over here inside our ln expression, which gives us the inverse of our 
ln expression over here. Okay, so we could look at the implications of this expression. Okay, so for a spontaneous process, this means that our E cell has to be positive. This will happen if pressure 1 is greater than pressure 2. Okay, so this will imply that we have a net movement of matter from our anode to our cathode. Okay, so if, however, we have the reverse, that will be a non-spontaneous process. And if the pressures are now going to be equal, that is when we have equilibrium. Okay, so this will imply that our E cell is going to be equal to zero. So overall, those were the different types of electrochemical cells that we'll be discussing. So there's a lot of different applications for them. So one, you could determine the spontaneity and completeness of a reaction based on electrochemical measurements of potential. And we could also calculate other equilibrium constants such as Ksb, Kf. And we could determine thermodynamic properties of a system, as we saw earlier. And other analytical chemistry applications include potentiometric determination of analyte concentration. Okay, so let's check out a problem in which we use principles of electrochemistry in order to determine an equilibrium constant, such as Ksb. Okay, so in this particular problem, we need to design a cell that will allow us to determine the Ksb of lead sulfate. And after the design of the cell, we need to calculate the Ksp of lead sulfate. So actually, this type of problem is kind of like a reverse of one of our earlier problems involving the determination of the standard reduction potential of a metal insoluble salt half-reaction electrode. Okay, so we're just going to be taking another approach this time. So overall, we need to figure out the equilibrium constant of this reaction over here. Okay, so we have lead sulfate forming lead two, I lead two ions and sulfate ions. Okay, so we have a corresponding Ksp for this, okay? So we need to find half reactions that involve lead sulfate and lead ions, okay? So one way we can do this is to consult appendices that tabulate standard reduction potentials. So for our cathode, it's best if we use a half reaction that involves lead sulfate. So the corresponding half reaction for this will be lead sulfate plus two electrons forming lead solid plus sulfate ions. Okay, So this is our metal insoluble salt half reaction. Okay, so the corresponding standard reduction potential for this based on tabulated reduction potentials is negative 0.36 volts. Okay, so for our anode, we should find a half reaction that involves lead solid and lead 2 plus ions. Okay, so we need to make sure that our lead solid is going to cancel out and replace it with lead 2 ions as indicated in our desired reaction over here. Okay, so this will be lead solid forming lead 2 plus and 2 electrons. Okay, so we have an oxidation here. So the standard oxidation potential is going to be the negative of the standard reduction potential as listed on tabulated standard reduction tables. So this is going to be equal to the negative of negative 0 0.13 volts, okay? So if we check out these reactions and we add them together, we see here that our net cell reaction is going to be our desired reaction, okay? So we have lead sulfate forming lead to ions plus our sulfate ions, okay? So the cell potential for this is going to be equal to negative 0.36 plus 0 0.13 so that is negative 0 0.23 volts okay so this cell over here is going to have a corresponding k okay so we can see here that this net reaction is the same as the solubility product reaction so the equilibrium constant for the cell reaction is going to be equivalent to our ksp okay so keep in mind again that we have hess's law holding so our gibbs free energy and therefore our our equilibrium constant is a state function 
So the pathway in which we get to our final reaction over here, even if it involves redox reactions, does not really affect the value of k that we ultimately get for the reaction here. Okay, so we could solve for our equilibrium constant in the following. Okay, so this is going to be E raised to Nf E naught over Rt. Okay, so our equilibrium constant, which is equal to our Ksp, this is equal to 1.67 times 10 raised to negative 8. Okay, so this is our Ksp based on electrochemical data. Okay, so this is just one way in which we could apply electrochemical data in investigating equilibrium systems. Okay, so we could also apply the same strategy for complexation processes as well as for acid-base problems.